Good morning. We want to welcome you to the worship services of First United Methodist Church in Camden, Arkansas, as we celebrate this three-day weekend uh, of Labor Day. Uh, and most people think it's the official end of the summer. We're glad you are joining us. Last week, we finished our series on Genesis, and this week we will start looking at the Gospels. Today, we're just going to do a, a general thing of why the Gospel writers wrote the Gospels, and next week we'll start into the Gospel of Mark. I want you to pay a special attention to our prayer list because it is extensive. Uh, want to especially note uh, some of the people that we have in the hospital. Um, Gary Grimes will have his cancer surgery on the 7th. Um, also want to mention Cooper Daugherty, who's having shoulder surgery on the 9th. Elizabeth Rowlett, who is in um, Arkansas Children's Hospital having cancer treatments. Uh, and also uh, Don Smith, that's Martha's brother, who is in the hospital in El Dorado with COVID. Um, several of these others uh, are hospice, making note of Lamar Moore, Charlotte Turner, and Marion Dorflinger. I hope if you have a chance this week, you will drop, uh, pick a few names, drop a card in the mail. It would be most appreciated. As our country faces many challenges right now, uh, the challenges of COVID, the challenges of keeping schools open during the pandemic, um, the challenge of our constant uh, conflicts, uh, let us lift our nation up in prayer. Let us remember to lift one another up in prayer. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. surrounded by God's Holy Spirit, who encourages us to walk faithfully with Christ. Praise be to God, whose goodness and mercy fills our days. Praise be to God, whose ways leads us to peace and justice. Let us pray. God of abundant life, you want the best for your people all around the globe. You bring healing, wholeness, and new life to all your children. On this day, may our eyes be open to the presence of Christ in one another. May our ears be open to the needs of our community. May our hands be open to serve your Holy Spirit along this journey of faith. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Will you join as we sing the hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. Teach me. 
God of us all, your grace and mercy fill our lives every day. We give you our thanks and praise. Too often we forget or ignore your presence in our lives. Too often we treat your children unequally, deeming some more important than others. Too often we forget that our daily actions need to reflect our faith. Forgive us and lead us to embrace abundant life for all your children. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Brothers and sisters, Christ, the great healer, brings healing and wholeness to our lives. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. So this morning I want to have a brief children's time with you because in the sermon I'm going to do, it's very important that we look at the faith of children first. I'm like many of you. I grew up going to church uh, from the time I was born. I don't ever remember not going to church. I went to Sunday school and I went to training union and I went to girls auxiliary. I went to um, choir. Uh, children's choir to junior choir and I absolutely love the church when we are children we have great faith while I was recording earlier this week um, my finance chairman sent me this beautiful beautiful um, video our, uh, she serves on our prayer team, and our prayer team has been very busy the last several months. Our prayer list is extensive, and we share uh, both the public requests and we share some private requests. And um, in this season of COVID and school starting, um, and with many in our congregation who have uh, cancer treatments, uh, our, our time in prayer has been uh, a lot. But the video she sent, uh, and, and she put a note with it that said, since we share so much hard news, I would like to share some good news with you. And it was a child giving their testimony about God. And he talked about how God is a dad and that God loves you. And as I was listening to him, I thought he must have a great dad because he spoke with love and affection and knowing that his dad uh, cares about him and protects him. And often that is exactly not only what we teach our children, but what we believed when we were young children. And then something happens. Uh, something happens where we grow a little cynical or something happens where the faith of our childhood is challenged. And so many children as they become teenagers and then as they become young adults, leave the church and leave their faith because they have discovered that the God of their adulthood isn't quite what they expected as a child. And that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart because for many of us, we may have gone through that phase, but we didn't let go of our faith. And we had questions, and maybe we had to rethink some things. And if you work at it, um, the faith of your childhood does return because you discover that that God does love you as much as you thought God did 
and that God is with you just as you thought God was. And in so many ways, that is the message of the Gospels we were talking about today. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for the faith of our children, for the faith that we teach our children. Give us the courage to allow them to ask questions just as we have questions. And continue to bless our ministry, not only with our children, but also our teenagers and our young adults. We pray this in your name. Amen. So last week, we actually had our last sermon in the Goss, in, in Genesis. And it was um, looking uh, at those last five chapters, looking at the life of Joseph and, and seeing the consistency in the story. We're moving out of the Hebrew Bible and we're going to the New Testament. And we're specifically going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark beginning next week. But I thought on this Labor Day weekend we might get something out of looking at the Gospels as a whole. Because we have four Gospels written by four different people. And there are things that are consistent about them, like the passion story, and then there's things that are inconsistent about them. One tells one story one way, and another one tells another story another way, and they have a unique voice and a unique emphasis. So today, we're just going to look at the bigger picture because if we were trying to um, make the Bible more consistent, it seems that you would have one gospel story uh, told in a consistent fashion and uh, instead of four unique gospels. So how did that come to happen and, and what is the point? That's what we're going to look at today. There actually was someone that took all four Gospels and wrote from it one Gospel. In the late second century, a student of the Roman Christian apologist Justin Martyr took on a project of combining all four Gospels into one Gospel. His name was Titanian, and the combined gospel was called Diatessaron, and that means out of four. So out of four gospels came one narrative. It's important to note that by mid-2nd century, it was written in the late 2nd century, but by mid-2nd century, the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had um, become established as the standard for churches. Even though the Orthodox canon uh, would not formalize the New Testament books until the late 7th century, and at the Council of Trillian, in 692, and the Catholic Church would not do so until the Council of Rome into the 382. The di diatessaron no longer exists, but it was used by the Syriac Christians for over two centuries. This one gospel was about 75% in length of the four Gospels combined together. In other words, Titanian took out about 25% uh, not only of material that he found redundant, 
but also things he felt were unnecessary. When the Catholic Church and later the Orthodox Church canonized the Bible, this combined gospel was rejected in favor of four separate gospels that we have today. This one gospel has since been lost. We knew it existed, we have pieces of it, but we no longer have the whole thing. But we do have some accounts of what Titinian uh, worked on and, and how he went about this. He left out the genealogy that we find in the first gospel of Matthew. He left out the reading that we're going to do today from the gospel of Luke. He found it unnecessary. Instead of taking one of the gospel's timelines and making the others fit in, he created his own timeline of events. By doing this work, Titanian created what my New Testament professor Clifton Black would have called almost Bible. Now before you chuckle, please note that we are guilty of almost Bible as well, especially every Christmas. We don't take Matthew's account or Luke's account or even John's strange beginning, and of course Mark doesn't have one, but we combine them together. So from Matthew, we get the Joseph story. From Matthew, we also get uh, the story of Herod and the wise men. And we call them three wise men, but there's no reference to the number three in there at all. From Luke, we pick up the familiar story of Mary and Joseph and the stable and the shepherds and the angels on that winter night. And typically, somewhere in telling the story will include something from the Gospel of John, such as God so loved the world. Since it's so easy to create one narrative, and it was basically done for us, why, why did the early church leaders decide to keep four Gospels in four different stories in four different voices. Each Gospel has a unique voice, and each Gospel also had a unique audience. We know more about their audience than we do the authors themselves. And while tradition has told us things such as Matthew was a disciple, the tax collector, and Luke was a physician, and Mark was John Mark, and, and John was the uh, disciple, there's actually no evidence of that and, and no documentation, no historical things to back that up. Here is what we do know, though. Mark is considered to be the oldest, even though it is the shortest gospel. Now, why do scholars think Mark is the oldest when tradition tells us that Matthew is the oldest? That is because when you look at the gospel of Matthew and you look at the gospel of Luke, you actually find 80% of the Gospel of Mark directly in the Gospel of Matthew. You find 65% of the Gospel of Mark directly inside the Gospel of Luke. We know that there was another source they used as well because there's somewhere around... Um, 230 verses 
that Matthew and Luke shared together that is not found in the Gospel of Mark. They called that source Q, and even though we no longer have that available to us, we haven't seen it, we know it existed because it's referenced. These three books, because they are shared sources, are called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Gospel of John is quite separate. Mark was written some 30 to 40 years following Jesus' death and resurrection. Matthew would have been written some 50 to 60 years later, and Luke 55 to 65 years later. John, even though it comes across as one voice, there's actually speculation that the story uh, was put together by a committee uh, of, of um, from the church and edited that way. Um, John was written later, maybe 50 to 80 years following Jesus' death and resurrection. Over the coming years, as we go to each gospel, we'll give you more information, but that's kind of an overview what we do want to ask today is why did each of these authors write their gospel? What we do know is that the birth of the church we call around Pentecost. So that would be following Jesus' death and resurrection so many days after his ascension. So that would have been somewhere around uh, the year 30 to the year 33. And they believe that at Pentecost that day, where all of the believers gathered, there was somewhere around 120. So that's it. 120 actual believers that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus had died and had been resurrected, there was 120. So that would have included the disciples. There was 11. Another one was elected, 12. That would include the, the followers around the 12. That would have included Mary Magdalene and the women that we knew that uh, were around at resurrection time that came to anoint Jesus. That probably would have included Joseph of Arimathea. It may have included even Nicodemus. But there was around 120. Of that 120, probably most, at least 80 to 90 percent, were actual eyewitnesses. It may have been even higher. They had seen Jesus. They had heard him speak. They may have dined with him. They have, may have been in his presence. They have, may have followed him for a year or two years or three years. There were members of his family, including his mother and his brother James. In those early years of the church from, say, 30, 33 to 70, a lot of eyewitnesses were in every church giving their testimony. But by the year 70, most of the apostles, those first disciples, and Paul, were dead, mostly by execution. The one remaining would have been uh, John. As the eyewitnesses started dying off or being executed, a second generation was coming of age. And 
they knew for the church to continue, they would have to retell these stories of the eyewitnesses. Because obviously Jesus was not coming back that quickly. So they started writing them down. Q was probably a source of one of these churches writing down the stories of the eyewitnesses. Scholars don't believe that any of the gospel writers were of that first generation, that mostly they were second and third generation. So I want you to think of the gospels as preachers or church leaders in these congregations, teachers in these congregations that wanted to retain the stories that were most meaningful. And so maybe they had a blog, if you read blogs, that they told one story one day and the next story the next day and they all blended in together for the gospel. Or maybe even a podcast where they told the story one by one by one. They thought it was important for those stories that meant the most to their congregation to be maintained. And those stories that were most important to the congregation were stories that dealt with the peculiar nature of each congregation. Two of the Gospels, Luke and John, give very specific reasons as to why they had written these down or why they had put together their Gospels. And those are the readings we're going to do today. One from the Gospel of Luke is right at the first, verses 1 through 4. Because Luke fancies himself as a first century historian, he writes in a two-volume set, so you'll see an identical version of these um, four verses show up in his second volume, which we call Acts of the Apostles. John places his at the very end. So at the end of John, the 21st chapter, we see his explanation. And so that's what I'd like to read to you today. So this is from Luke chapter 1. Many people have already applied themselves to the task of compiling an account of the events that has been fulfilled among us. So in this, Luke is telling us there are already existing Gospels, and that probably is Mark and maybe even Matthew. They use what the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed down to us. Now, after having investigated everything carefully, from the beginning, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you, most honorable Theophilus. I want you to have confidence in the soundness of the instruction you have received. And now looking at the 21st chapter of John, and if you recall, uh, the last story in John is Jesus cooking breakfast for his disciples and he specifically talks to Peter and asks him, uh, do you love me? And he did that three times and Peter was disappointed. And then there's a, um, another one of those stories between Peter and John. But here's the 24th and the 25th verses. This is the disciple who testifies concerning these things and who wrote them down. Jesus did many other things as well. If all of them were recorded, I imagine the world itself wouldn't have been enough room.
for the scrolls that would have been written. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be our delight, O Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. Walter Brueggemann is now in his late 80s. But for decades, he has been a voice for the church and a prophetic voice, a poetic voice as well. He challenges the church to be what the church was intended to be. And here are his words, which I have used before. The prophetic task of the church are, and he lists three things. One, to tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion. Two, to grieve in a society that practices denial. To three, express hope in a society that lives in despair. To tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion. To grieve in a society that practices denial. And to expect, express hope and a society that lives in despair. The writers of our four Gospels understood human beings. What Brueggemann said was true in ancient biblical times as we saw in Genesis. It was true in the first century beginnings of the church, and it is true today. Both Luke and John, as today's examples, understood the illusions of their communities. Luke lived in the world of Gentiles, and Gentiles were non-Jews, and as such, they were outsiders to pious Jews. God's promises does not, did not extend to the Gentiles, not until Jesus came along. They were considered unclean because they didn't follow the law. Now, Gentiles had their own idols, and Gentiles had their own gods, and they lived in a society with a class system where there were slaves and there were servants. There was a middle class, uh, merchant class. And then there were the elite, the upper crust. Your value as a human being depended on which class you belong to. It depended on your status. Here's what Luke knew. Status is an illusion. Status is an illusion, especially in the eyes of God. Luke wanted his people to remember the stories of Jesus that defined their status in God's eyes. The healing of the lepers where the unclean and those that were shunned from the community were brought back in to the community. The three lost parables, the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost son that we refer to as the prodigal son, where God continually seeks us out, not just the circumcised, but the uncircumcised. The Good Samaritan, where the pious one 
wasn't the one who acted as a good neighbor, but the outcast Samaritan was held up as an example of how we were to serve our neighbors. Luke continually wanted to remind the lost, the outcast, and the unwanted that Jesus was continually drawing a wider circle to take us all in so we could all be included. The writer of the Gospel of John understood the illusions as well and understood the illusions that surrounded his community in Ephesus. His people were not born outcast, but they became outcast because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Their friends deserted them. Their families abandoned them. This faith communion, this faith, this church in Ephesus, had to hold closely to one another and close the bonds of the gospel and the spirit that bound them to one another. John wanted to remind his congregation of what was true. He compared the light and the darkness and he's told the story of the blind man who did not see the man that actually healed his eyes. But even though he did not see him, he held fast to this stranger who had given him a new vision. And he held fast to it even as he was rejected by the priest and rejected by his own parents. The gospel writers wanted to remind their readers of truth. When we live in a world full of illusions, they wanted their people to be constantly holding the truth that would eventually set them free. John and Luke understood our human tendency towards denial. We like to live in denial so we don't have to look at the hard stuff. We don't want to look as people in power. We don't want to notice injustice. They want people to believe that poverty is caused by laziness. They wanted people to deny aging and death. Societies want to paint a picture that maintains status quo for those in power. You and I, we know this. We live in denial that there's injustice in our world. We live in denial of inequities. We want to deny aging and death. We want to deny the realities of COVID and what it will require from all of us to get out of it. We want to deny climate change because it's inconvenient. We live in denial of the choices we make and if we are honest, there's a lot of subjects we don't want to talk about. We don't want to talk about school shootings. We don't want to talk about segregation. We don't want to talk about domestic terrorism. We don't want to talk about climate change. We don't want to talk about addictions. But our gospel writers would not have it. They knew that because we live in denial and we do that because the truth causes so much despair. But 
Friends, the writers of the gospel didn't write about despair. They wrote about hope. You see, Jesus offers a new way of living that creates an imagination that can actually see our world different. And our imagination, we can see God's kingdom. And not only can we see it, but we can dare to believe in it. A kingdom where all people are loved and cherished. A kingdom where our worth is seen through the image of God. Stamped upon each life from the beginning. Where our gifts and our graces are shared and cherished in community. Where we can imagine and envision a community of forgiveness and reconciliation that models for the world. The gospel writers wrote down these stories so we can know that God loved us enough, so much, that God took on human flesh and all the limitations of human flesh and lived among us and was willing to die an excruciating death to create a new reality so we would never have to live in fear again. We don't need to fear rejection. We don't need to fear transformation. We don't need to fear that our identity will be lost because our identity will be found in our baptism and no one can take that away. We don't even have to fear death. Matthew told it in a way that those familiar with Hebrew scripture can see the truth. Mark told it in a way where those that were suffering could hope again. Luke told it in a way where outcasts find community. John told it in a way that those who live in darkness could see the light. They got it. And if we are honest with ourselves, we should get it too. We know we live in a world of illusion and denial and despair. You can turn on Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, or any other news channel. And you will hear the themes of illusion, denial, and despair every single day. They feed it to us and we eat it up. As a result, look what we are doing to each other. Damage families, damage communities, damage countries, damaged world. I accepted my call to ministry to tell the truth from Scripture, to grieve with my people the realities of life. To both live in hope and to offer hope. The Bible gave that to me. And it gives it to me every day. It is the story of God's love for us. It gives me the courage to dare to imagine something better than what we have. 
my friends, if we cannot imagine a better future, then we can't implement anything. If we can't see something better, if we can't see the kingdom of God, then any efforts we make will be futile. We can't build a better world unless we can imagine God's kingdom and the gospel writers knew this and passed it on to us in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen now will you join me in our prayer response and before you think it's the same one we've used with Genesis it's now a different one let us be doers of the word and not hearers only. For as we persevere in godly living, we bear the fruit of the Spirit and build up the whole household of God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now will you join me in our hymn of invitation and dedication, Thy Word is a Lamp to My Feet. Amen. Mm -hmm. 